Well, amen, church family. Again, what a joy it is to be able to come together to open up the Word of God and uh, to, to meet with the Lord today. And as, as we do that, we've been walking through Ephesians for the last several weeks, and we, we have been walking through what are uh, some serious issues that confront the life of every church. We've, we've looked at the call to walk worthy of our calling and to, to preserve and protect the unity that the Spirit gives and to take off the old self, to put on the new self. And just remind all of us, why, why, are, you know, why are we walking through these things? Let me be clear. It's not because I am secretly aware of all these things going on in the life of the congregation, and this is my pastoral passive-aggressive way to address it. It's simply because months ago, God impressed on my heart for us to walk through the book of Ephesians, and the way we do that is simply verse by verse. So why are we now looking at all these things on unity and the old putting off the old self and putting on the new self? Because by God's goodness, it's just where we are in Ephesians. And I say that to say to make sure we remember what exactly it is that Ephesians has been overwhelmingly communicating. Paul is writing to a group of believers who, remember, are, are living in what is the most prosperous, uh, thriving economic city, uh, diverse, religiously diverse, ethnically, uh, there in the city of Ephesus in what is now modern-day Turkey. And he writes to this group of people just like he writes to you and I, and he, he drives home this point that God is actively at work in this world, in our world where there are active proxy wars in the Middle East and and geopolitical wars in Eastern Europe, in our world where there is economic tension from inflation, in our world where in many parts of society trust has been lost, which news source can you trust? In our world in which there is, are impending elections that will have real consequences, in our world God is actively up to bringing all things and all beings into their rightful alignment under the Lordship of Jesus for joy, for those who are aligned rightly with Christ, for destruction, for those who are aligned wrongly with Christ. And God is doing this work through His church. And each and every local church that abides in Christ, that church which is made up of men and women, boys and girls, who were once by birth and nature dead in their trespass and sins, in rebellion and hostile to the things of God, alienated from each other ethnically, and on the outside looking in at the life that God desires for humanity to know. But God, rich in mercy because of the great love with which He loved us, has saved each and every man, woman, boy, and girl who has responded to the Holy Spirit's conviction of their sin and has trusted Jesus Christ for their salvation. Those whom are saved by grace through faith are adopted as sons and daughters. They are made family, brothers and sisters, and through the church, God is working. Which is why then Paul has been walking through and he, is, he has called us to, to walk worthy of the manner of which we've been called, to preserve the Holy Spirit's unity among us through the faithful use of the diverse gifts God has given to us as we all are growing individually and collectively into the maturity of Jesus. And that at the core of doing that, we've got to understand the old self was crucified. There's been a, a new man that has risen with Christ, so therefore the, the old self, the old ways of thinking, the old ways of acting, we throw those off like ragged shirts with holes from college, and we put on the new self in Christ. And last week we watched as Paul got extremely practical that the new self speaks truth. The new self angers correctly and doesn't allow righteous anger to be perverted into sin. That the new self doesn't give the devil a place to attack. The new self doesn't speak rotten words, but only those things which are edifying and, and on and on down the line. And we come to chapter 5 today, and it is not disconnected from all that I've just reminded us of. It is, it is really, it is the buffer. It's the other book end. Paul began by saying, do not walk 
like those without Christ. And now look what he says. Look with me, Ephesians 5, verse 1. In light of all of this, therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave Himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a fragrant aroma. It says, in light of all of this, be imitators of God. Actively, habitually, presently, let the conduct of your life be that by which, and it's your choice, you make a choice to, to, to live habitually imitating God. Now, that word imitate, you don't know the Greek word, but you actually do. Because the Greek word we've somewhat transliterated into English, and you know the English word to mimic someone. When he says to imitate God, he says mimic God. Now, what, what does he mean by that? Obviously, you and I can't imitate God in the sense of there are aspects of who God is you and I will never be. God is triune, we are not. God is almighty, all-knowing, all-powerful, we are not. What is he saying? He's saying to imitate God, and he's going to get real specific with what, what it is in a second, but to imitate God's character. Be imitators of God. How? As beloved children. Now, what do you mean by as beloved children? It means why should I imitate God? If I'm in Christ, I should imitate God. I should imitate His character because I am a beloved child. But it's not only why should I imitate, but how should I go about? How should I, how should I carry myself as I seek to imitate God? With what character should I do it? With the seriousness of a child who knows they are beloved. You say, well, beloved child. Remember back in Ephesians 1. It said that God in His love chose us before the foundations of the world to be holy and blameless, that in His love He predestined us to be adopted as sons, as full heirs through Christ. It says as beloved children, beloved is a form of the Greek word agape, that unconditional love which flows out of the very goodness of God. and. Out of the goodness of God, He looks at you and I as human beings and places a value of the highest degree upon us, not because of what we can do, not because of what we will do, but simply because He is good. And in His agape, He sent His one and only Son, Jesus Christ, out of His great love, love which was from everlasting, and acted on it while we were still sinners. It is God's great love. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4, that drives our salvation to be saved by grace through faith. It's in love, simply put, that God has sent His one and only unique, one-of-a-kind Son on a predetermined mission to be crushed for our sake. And God's love is part of His very character. It's who He is which means His love can't be swayed or tossed away. His love is not, we talk of agape, and we'll look at it more in a moment, it's not simply just some emotional infection that has highs or highs or lows. It's who He is, and who He is never changes. So quite simply put, He says, he says, if you're going to understand what it means to put on the new self, if you're going to understand what it means, believer, to walk worthy of the calling to which you have been called, ultimately it's going to be as a, to recognize one's position as a beloved child. And what do beloved children love to do? When a child is loved by their parents, they love to mimic the parent. Jesse will do things. I being like you, Dad, melts my heart. Some of you know, I hate condiments. I don't like ketchup, don't like mustard, and I really don't like mayonnaise. They're all gross, and none of them are in heaven. <laughs> so enjoy them here. Now, you know, they go, oh, Pastor, why, why don't you like? Now, there's a story behind each of those, but, but to our point here, mayonnaise. Why don't you like mayonnaise? Because here's what's fascinating. 
As a young child, I ate mayonnaise on every sandwich. Why do I not eat mayonnaise now and haven't since a young child? Because my father hates mayonnaise. And as a young kid, as a young son who is loved by his dad and wants to be like his dad, when I heard dad doesn't like mayonnaise, I decided I don't like mayonnaise. And I acknowledge that's a horrible reason. But for 30 plus years of my life, I have imitated my dad who loves me by not eating mayonnaise. And Lord willing, my children will mimic me as well. <laughs> the point is, when you are a child who is beloved and understands and revels in the love of your Father, it is the reason that drives you to imitate your Father. You and I are loved by God in a way that is beyond full comprehension. It says, as beloved children, be imitators of God. Well, what specifically are we to imitate God? Well, look, He gives a second command. If imitate God is the first command, here's the second that really fleshes it out. Walk in love. Both of these commands, be imitators and walk, they're present tenses, meaning they should be the defining habit of each of our lives. They're, they're in an, a voice that means they're not things we wait around for someone to do through us or to us. They are active choices we have to make. You and I choose to imitate the character of God. You and I choose to walk in love. And they are both commands, not suggestions. But by virtue of being a command, when God gives a command to His children, He doesn't give commands that are impossible. He gives commands that by His grace, through the power of the Holy Spirit who lives within the life of every true Christian, are, are doable. He says, walk in love. Walk, the foundational functional movement of life, should be the foundational movement of how we live and move and breathe with each other as a church. Walk in love, in agape. Now, I mentioned this already. Agape is, we, we will often call it unconditional love, but why is it unconditional? It's not unconditional because it's, it's wishy-washy and doesn't have an opinion. God has an opinion on everything. There are things that please Him. There are things that displease Him. No, when we talk about agape love, what we mean is it is a love, it is that highest and noblest form of love where God looks at mankind in His image and says, you are of this worth and value to me. And that worth and value does not change no matter how high you go or how low you fall but is tied to who I am as God, your creator. And what is the value that God has given to humankind? The highest. Because there is no greater gift that could be given than the sacrifice of God's one and only unique Son, Jesus Christ, on our behalf. It says, in this love that you and I are to walk in love, context is with each other, where we see and value each other, not for how you make me feel or I make you feel, but for how God sees and values you. That what drives my thinking, that what determines my decisions, that what spurs on my action is to love you how God loves you. That's what he says, walk in love. I feel, well, this is good, but what does that look like? Well, look back with me. Be imitators of God by walking in love just as Christ also loved you and gave up Himself for us. How am I, how am I as a member of the body of Christ, with all believers of all time and all places, but specifically a visible member of, of the body of Christ that is First Baptist Church Pflugerville. How am I to interact with you? How are you to interact with me? How are we to interact with each other? 
We are to love each other just as Christ loved us. By the way, it means Christ's love for us, which we'll look at clearly in a second. His love for us doesn't change. He's already demonstrated it. It's set in stone. It is how he has loved us from before we were created. It is how he loved us when we were in dead in our trespasses and sins. It is how he loved us when he gave himself up as the offering and the sacrifice on our behalf. It's how he loves us even now. And how did he love us? He gave himself up. Now it is a unique construction grammatically that's clear in our English Bibles, but most of us are not grammarians, and it just goes past us. When it says He gave Himself up, the word gave up is literally to surrender, to relinquish oneself to. It says He relinquished, He surrendered Himself to be an offering and a sacrifice to God. But it's not just that he gave himself up because he recognized it was the politically savvy thing to do in the moment. It's not that he just gave himself up to be a sacrifice and offering because he was, was, was kind of, his hand was forced and there wasn't anything else he could do. No, the way it's constructed, he gave himself. He himself is the one who chose to give himself up. He was a willing participant Jesus did not die because someone forced his hand. He laid down his life willingly. No one took it from him. He did it for the joy set before him. He despised the shame of becoming my sin and your sin on the cross that we might become his righteousness in Christ and have peace with God. It's reflected when he prays in the garden, not my will, O Lord, but yours be done, said the one who came not to be served, but to serve and to intentionally give his life as a ransom for many. It says in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified in Christ. I no longer live, but it is Christ who lives within me. In the life that I live in this body, I live by faith in the Son of God who died and gave himself up for me, who loved me and gave himself up for me. It is the love of Jesus Christ to save you and me, a hopeless sinner, dead in trespass and sins, that drove Jesus to voluntarily raise his hand and say, you want to all abandon me? Go. You want to, you want to beat my head with reeds? Bring it on. You want to whip my body bare of skin so that I'm just one giant wound? I'll take it. You want to take that crown of nail-length thorns and beat it into my brow, I'll take it. You want to put me on the most torturous form of death ever scientifically devised by ancient man, I'll do it. And all of that's nothing because what I'm truly choosing to do is I am willingly and joyfully going on that cross to take the just sentence of wrath that your sin and my sin deserves. Jesus says, I do it willingly. Why? Because he loved us. In fact, that word offering there, it's a word for an offering that is brought voluntarily. Jesus gave himself up voluntarily. The word sacrifice is the word used for the, the shedding of the blood of animals to atone for sin. And, and who was the voluntary offering and sacrifice given to? Notice it says to God. Because who was it? Who, who is our sin in rebellion against? God. So it's for God so loved the world, he sent his one and only son, and his one and only son so loved us that he gave himself up willingly for the joy set before him. And it is in this self-sacrificial, outward-looking, generous giving of, of, of oneself that God looked at Jesus' sacrifice, and it says, for a fragrant aroma, it means simply that God found it pleasing. It satisfied the justice of God. It satisfied the heart of God. And the implication there for you and me, church family, 
is that if you are in Christ, you are a beloved child and we are called to imitate our Father. We are called to imitate God by loving one another the same way that Jesus loves us. We are called to see each other how God sees us. We are called to value each other how God values us. We are called to give up, to surrender ourselves for the good of one another. This passage started by saying, don't walk like those who are lost without Christ back in chapter four. What do those who are lost without Christ do? They surrender, they give themselves up to sin. You and I have been saved by grace. We're called to walk in a manner worthy of our calling. And what does that mean at its core? It means to so love one another that we give ourselves up willingly and sacrifice to serve each other. As beloved children, we are called to imitate God by loving each other like Christ loves us. Now you say, well, how are we gonna do that, Pastor? Well, real simply, one, in order to do this, you must know the character of God and the love of Christ in salvation. You cannot imitate somebody you don't know. And you cannot know and experience the overwhelming joy of being beloved by God when you have not been reconciled to Him by grace through faith in Christ. If you are on the outside looking in, alienated by your sin, you cannot imitate God and know the love of Christ. This love, which by the way, 1 John, uh, John tells us in 1 John, it is a defining mark of a true Christian, that a true Christian is marked by an agape, self-sacrificial, unconditional love for those in Christ. And yet, in many of our churches, so many don't love year after year after year after year. And so I simply say today, you need to understand today, there are some in this room, you need to know Jesus loves you is not a kindergarten song taught in Sunday school. It is true. Jesus has gone, if we can just put on serious, sober-minded thinking for a moment, There is an eternal price of the pleasure of your sin. It is eternal justice which will feel like eternal death. And Jesus paid that price, not because you could offer Him something or do something for Him, not because one day you might be… He paid the price knowing you would never be able to earn it, that you would never deserve it, and He paid the price joyfully to have the opportunity to wash you clean in His blood and reconcile you to God where you are adopted as a son or daughter. Jesus really does love you, and that love transforms your life. And if you don't know Him, you can't know that joy if you don't come and respond to the conviction that you, in fact, are not right with God. Some of you in this room say, well, I'm right with God because I go to church. I'm right with God because I read my Bible. I'm right with God because look at what I do. I want to be real clear. You're not right with God because of what you do. There's only one way to be right with God, and it's because of what Jesus did. And you cannot, you can think yourself a Christian, you can fake yourself the jersey, but if you're not really saved by the grace of God through faith alone in Christ Jesus alone, you cannot imitate the character of God and know the love of God to then reciprocate to one another. And if that's you, would you, would, would you just respond to the Holy Spirit today and may today be the day of salvation? Now for many of us in this room, we've been saved by grace through faith in Christ. We do know in salvation the character of God and the love of Christ. What we must do is we must grow in the character of God and the love of Christ. We must grow just like we can't imitate one who we don't know. Here's the other reality. We will not imitate one we do not love. And we will always imitate whoever it is we actively adore. Church family, brothers and sisters, do you understand today 
Jesus loves you. You are beloved by God. Right where you are right now. You may be walking the best you've ever walked with Jesus. You may be living in outright carnality, grieving the heart of the Holy Spirit. But if you are in Christ, you are God's beloved. You are God's beloved because of what Jesus has done for you. We are perfectly loved, church family, and we must find identity in it. It's we who are loved who, are, who, who in response, mimic God and love one another. Now, let me be clear, church family. Many of us in this room are tired and weary. Be clear, we do not earn the love of God or the status of being beloved. We're simply beloved by, in Christ by grace through faith. And each of us must learn to be content to be His beloved, though increasingly aware of how much we don't deserve it. God's love has been poured into our hearts, it says Romans 5, lavishly through the Holy Spirit, who now bears forth His love in us and through us, Galatians 5. And if you and I will understand this love, what does it say? Casts out fear. Perfect love casts out fear, 1 John 4, which means as you and I grow in understanding the character of God, as you and I are plunged into the, the, uh, the eternal depths of Christ's love for us, as you and I grow deeper and deeper and deeper, the understanding of that perfect love casts out fear, and we live out this love in confidence and hope and conviction. But I wonder how much many of us spend time actively reflecting on the reality of Christ's love for us. Let me put it a different way. What is your perception of God today, brother and sister? Do you struggle to see God and His goodness? Is God a legalistic slave master, the driving head coach, or, or is your view of God dictated by what He says about Himself? See, here's the reality. Our perception, the thoughts I actively choose to think about God, will directly dictate how I walk with God and how well I grow. So if I entertain thoughts about God, and trust me, church family, all of us are wired differently. For me, as wired, wired as someone who's, who's perfectionistic and, 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 and driven to perform, and what that looks like with God, it is easy for me to make God's love something that I have to earn. The pro and I can meditate and that thought can drill over me and it can produce anxiety over me. And if I keep fixated on that, It'll impact and impair the joy with which I walk with Jesus. But here's the great news. The Bible already tells me that thought is wrong. And I can go, that thought's wrong. Instead, let me just sit here and meditate and ponder and rest in the fact that on my best day or worst day, by God's grace, I have been saved and I am beloved. We must grow in the character of God and the knowledge of the love of Christ. By the way, this is why Paul's already taught us one way to pray just two chapters earlier when he said, for this reason I bow my knee and I pray that all of you would be strengthened in your inner man, that you would be able to comprehend what is the, the uncomprehensible vastness of God, of His power, of His majesty, of His presence, of His nearness with you, and that you would be able to grasp what is the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Are we praying that for one another? Are we praying that in our own lives? Because the last part is this, how do we live this out? You've got to know. If you know, you've got to grow. And if we're growing, then it's very simple. We make a choice to live out the character of God and the love of Christ Jesus. Church family, love is what it all comes down to. How did Jesus summarize the commandments? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love the Lord God with, all your, whole, with your whole being. And flowing out of that, love your neighbor as yourself. It all comes down to love. We are called to love. Why? And why are we able to love? Because He first loved us, 1 John 4. We cannot love one another if we do not love God firstly. 
But the flip side of that is our love for each other is a tangible, direct reflection of our love for God. And we can say all day long, man, we love God. Oh, I love His Word. I, but if we treat each other like garbage, we don't really love God. Love is what it all comes down to, church family. And here's the reality. We saw last week, speak the truth, each one of you with his neighbor. Be angered, yet do not sin. No longer steal, but work hard to give away. Let no unwholesome word proceed, but only an encouraging word. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Don't give the devil a place. Let all bitterness and wrath throw it away. Be kind, tenderhearted, forgiving. All of those things will naturally flow out of our lives if we are defined by love. So real simply, church family, do you love the church? Jesus loves the church. The church is the bride of Christ, and Jesus is always good to His bride. He never gossips about her. He never backstabs her. He never knocks down to her or about her, even when she makes a fool of herself. Talk about this in premarital counseling. Talk to couples. You're going to fell each other at some point. How will you respond to that? Listen, Jesus never fells his bride, but his bride does fell Jesus. And Jesus doesn't go behind our back and start, well, I just can't believe what my bride did. Should have taken the other girl. Yet so often, church family, and I'm not trying to say that churches don't get messy. I'm not trying to say that. I have seen more messiness than most for my young years. But so many today will take any reason, whether it be real and serious or whether it be small and meaningless, they'll take any reason to demean the church and ju justify their disdain for her. And that is not loving the church like Christ loves the church. By the way, you can say anything nasty you want to about me. Don't you dare go after my wife. Now, vice versa, many of you would say the same thing. Pastor, you can say anything you want to to me, but don't you dare go after my wife. My point is, if that's how we feel, why do we take so freely to just come after the church? Do you love the church? And I just mean big picture church family. Do we love the church? Now let's get more specific. Do we love those we see around us in this church? Because that's the other side. Oh, I love the church. I love those believers on the other side of the world who can't do anything to annoy me or mess up my little world. Do you love the person sitting in front of you, behind you, around you, across the room from you? And when I say, do we love one another, church family, understand, when I say, do we agape one another, I don't mean do we feel warm affection for one another. But I mean, do we value one another in such a way that we are actively sacrificing ourselves for each other's good? The real test of our love is not just how we feel about one another, but how we value and sacrifice for each other. And what is, what is, what is it, what is, what does this love look like if, if we do love one another? Well, listen to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not jealous, envious. Love does not brag, boast of oneself. It is not arrogant, thinking more highly of oneself than one ought. It does not act unbecomingly or rude. It does not seek its own. It is not quickly provoked. It doesn't take into account a wrong suffered, meaning it doesn't keep a list of everything wrong someone's ever done to you so you can bring it back out and say, this justifies why I can treat you unloving. It doesn't rejoice in unrighteousness. Love never, love never rejoices at sin. Love does not celebrate. Agape love of God does not celebrate sin. Instead, it rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things. Love believes all things. Love hopes all things. Love endures all things. Church family, if we love one another, we'll be patient with one another, kind with one another. We'll be uneasily provoked with one another. We'll never rejoice in sin in each other's lives, but we rejoice with the truth reigning in each other's lives. We'll bear one another. 
We'll believe the best about one another. We will lay ourselves down for one another. Here's the real question, church family. Are we willing to actively lay ourselves down for the good of our brothers and sisters here at First Baptist Pflugerville? Are we willing to give up even preferences and opinions for the good of others to the glory of God, that others would grow? Let me put it real simple. No, oh, no this applies to everybody. I'm not picking on anybody. We all get toe stepped on today. Am I willing to give up my seat, my room, my preferred time, my preference in music, my favorite event, my day off, my finances, my free space, and I can keep adding more and more. Am I willing to sacrifice for your good in love? See, here's the reality, church family. Be honest. One of the things I love about First Baptist Church Pflugerville is the love for one another is rich between us. Not saying we're perfect. I am saying I've been a part of a lot of churches, and and, and Bethany and I frequently talk. I frequently brag on the church. I have never felt so loved and cared for by a body of believers as we have here. So don't mistake the hard questions for, we're not doing it well. Church family, we're doing it well. But we still don't look just like Jesus, which means there's more to grow. And here's the danger. When you do something well, and you don't continue to press on, it can die so easily. I have thought often of this. A year ago, we were walking through the letters of the seven churches in Revelation. The first church is Ephesus. 60 years after Paul, or 50 years roughly after Paul will write this, John writes to the church in Ephesus, and and he tells them some wonderful things. He says, you believe the truth doctrinally, you are phenomenal. Ministerially, you are enduring despite fierce opposition. You apply your doctrine and you sniff out false teachers and and you don't listen to them. You've got correct beliefs. You are active in doing tons of ministry. You are doing it all in the face of, of massive cultural opposition. And if you'll remember those things, oh man, what a great church. And then Jesus says this to them. He says, I have one thing against you, that you have lost your first love. And then Jesus levels. He said, if you don't repent, it's not just, hey, get your love together. You're in sin. And if you don't repent of that sin, I will take your candlestick and I will remove it. Now, if you'll remember with me the imagery, right before he speaks to Ephesus, he says that Jesus walks amongst the candlesticks and the candlesticks are the churches. For Jesus to remove a candlestick is to say that local church is no longer walking with Him. Listen, God's church, capital C, will never die, but God will allow a local church to die when our love dies. If the first love is to be God, understand the implication. I can't love you if my love for God is lacking, but if I love God, then I love you, which means Ephesus had come to a point where they had right doctrine, they were doing tons of ministry, they were standing firm in the face of opposition, but their love for God had been dying, and therefore their love for each other was weak. Church family, we love well today, but we must ever push forward in growing to love all the better. Years ago when I was in college, there was a young man from a large country on the other side of the world whom we do a lot of business with, but doesn't like us. That should be enough information for you to know who I'm talking about. This young man was a student at DBU, and he had come to faith in Christ about a year after, um, about a year after our freshman year, and Carl was a man with a fire for Jesus, and Carl would poke his head in and go, hey guys, do you have time? We need to pray together. 
Now, you understand, when Carl comes in and says, do you have time we need to pray together, it's not going to be three minutes of praying for each other. It's going to be an hour minimum. So Carl poked his head in the RA office one day, one night, and he said, guys, I just, I've been thinking about this. He said, Galatians chapter 6 says, don't grow weary of doing good, but, but, but it puts this special focus on, and especially serving and loving each other in the body of Jesus. And he said, you know, I see so much in churches today that talk so much about loving our communities, loving the world, and, and, and just understand, he wasn't saying we shouldn't love our communities and love our world. We should. But he said, I only hear churches talk about loving our communities and loving the world when it seems like the emphasis in the church and Scripture is that we are to love one another. And he said, I wonder if the reason our witness is so weak in the world is because we're so weak at loving each other. And then interesting, because Jesus said, a new commandment I have given you, that you love one another. And by this, the world will know you're my disciples. Church family, I rejoice that we love each other well. But may next, this week into next Sunday, the next week, may we love each other even better. Why? Because we imitate God who first loved us. Why? Because you and I are beloved children, loved by Jesus Christ who freely gave himself up on our behalf. Let's pray. Jesus, we look to you. Thank you so very much that you love us. Father, open our eyes and hearts to really understand and grasp how much you truly do love us. Lord, that we would love each other in the same way. How many churches have died, Lord, because their love ran cold? But the church that loves you and loves each other Oh, Lord, there you will be in their midst. And that church, that church will survive and thrive until either you take us all home or you return, whichever happens first. Father, may we as a church be a church that faithfully loves each other how you loved us, how you love us. Father, if there's any in this place or online that do not know you, They've never experienced the joy of being your beloved, of knowing your love personally. May today be the day. Jesus, it's to you we look, and in your name I pray. Amen.